it was Friday afternoon, and Jesus is dead. His brutalized body hanging without life on a cross dropped into a hole in the dirt. His executioners had dug the holes, prepared the place, and done their job with ruthless efficiency. This wasn't how it was supposed to be. The hope of mankind overcome by powers of hell, by the shadow of a grave. We once knew what it was like to rule and reign on the earth. We were made to live in the light, in relationship, in purpose. We were made for more than what we've come to accept as normal. Ever since the garden, Satan and his kingdom have been tightening their grip. Darkness has ruled evil, chaos, suffering, hopelessness. We've been enslaved and crippled by the holes the enemy has been digging for us too. But instead of killing the Messiah, the cross became a catalyst for salvation. The hole that was dug to hold an instrument of shame and death was instead filled with an instrument to bring healing and new life. That's the way God is. Nothing is impossible with him. He's always restoring, always renewing, always able to take what was meant for evil and turn it for good. To take our graves and turn them into gardens. Why? Because he never gave up on his plan. He has never given up on us. He knows what we don't, that you can't have resurrection life without death, Jesus. He died so we can have lives of purpose and power over the grave. He is not dead. He is alive. And because he lives, we can live again. If you haven't noticed, uh, gardens is the theme for this Sunday. I grew up in a uh, family with a grandma who walked through the hillsides of Malibu talking about the plants all around us. We lived in a, a ranch in a canyon, and so all of the bushes had a meaning and a story behind it. There was uh, Indian chewing gum, which the rest of us call anise, that we would use uh, as we walked around in the, in the mornings. Um, there's uh, cactus apples that we would pick very carefully, <laughs> of course. Uh, Cleveland sage, which uh, even at this stage in my life, I can still smell that sweetness, um, probably my favorite one. The entire canyon was her garden, but she specifically had cultivated a one particular hillside into a very large, it was a large garden. I mean, if you've all had gardens, I can probably guarantee my gar grandma's garden was bigger. She had carved uh, terraces into the hillsides and planted every kind of fruit tree that she had grafted together. And there were orchids and there were amaryllises and there was all kinds of stuff, every color of flower that you can imagine. She had trailers full of plants that needed shade and she just, everything was just full of places. And dinner at her house began with a walk through the garden and it depended on what part of what season of the year it was and what vegetables were available and you would pick them up and it was either parsnips or carrots or tomatoes or broccoli or you know something and she always had far more than she needed so there was always boxes that were carried off to friends and neighbors uh, in other places even the walls in her house were covered with the pictures of her flowers her roses that she grew in her garden and the bookshelves were full of different gardening books and stuff like that as you go her occupation, she was a mechanical engineer. But she found life and hope and peace in her garden at home. I want to ask each of us this morning about the plants in your life. As you are walking, do plants, do nature, does, do gardens play a role in your life at all? Do you, have a, do you like to have a plant on your desk? You know, sometimes if you're just in a corporate environment, just having that one piece of greenery does something to you. It speaks to your soul, I will uh, uh, advocate for this morning. So, but where you grow up will influence the way, the kinds of gardens that you grew up with, right? If you grew up in a desert, what you view as a garden is very different than if you grew up on uh, a beach or if you grew up on a tropical island or a rainforest or something like that. They're all very different kinds, but there's life 
no matter where you go, one of the things that fascinates me every time we go to Israel is we go into these just, they look like empty, empty wadis, and yet there's life everywhere. There's all kinds of life. It's a very different kind of life, but there's life everywhere. And if you slow down and pay attention, you can see the life. And our impressions of nature or lack of nature in our lives interpret how we understand the gardens that we see in scripture. But gardens play a key role in the story of scripture. And it is fitting today that we're worshiping in a garden because of course Jesus was crucified and was buried in a garden, right? John chapter 19 verse 40 says, so they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen clothes with spices as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified was a garden, and in that garden a new tomb in which he had been laid. But not only that, Jesus was also betrayed in the garden. Remember John 18, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out to his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which his disciples entered into. But betrayal didn't begin just in the garden of Gethsemane. God had been betrayed in gardens since the very beginning of time. Gardens have played and will continue to play a role in God's plan, as I hope to show you today. Genesis, open your Bibles, the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2. Beginning of verse 8, Yahweh God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man who he had formed, and out of the ground Yahweh made to spring up every tree that is pleasant in sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of evil, good and evil. So there's a lot happening in this verse and I just wanna slow down for just a little bit uh, and focus on what's happening here. The first thing that we need to understand is the word that's used there for garden. In Hebrew is the word gan, but it's the word garden. And we don't see that word as often in the New Testament. The New Testament word when we talk about is paradise but that's a Persian word. Why would they be using a Persian word in the New Testament? Where did Persia come into Hebrew history? They were in exile in Babylon, right? So they imported this word. And so as we come to the New Testament, we're using, instead of gone, we're using paradise, which is the Persian word for garden. They're the same word. So you don't say the garden of paradise, it's repetitious. It means exactly the same. It would be, to say the garden of paradise, you'd be saying the garden of garden. The Garden of Eden is different than just the Garden of Paradise. So Eden, though, the word for Eden, it really actually means pleasure. And we said earlier, and we say this every Sunday, God is good, so I don't have to look elsewhere, right? He created this place for us that is not only sufficient for us to survive, he created a place for us that is abundant with goodness and beauty and amazement. Remember the hawks that were flying around? Do you hear the birds that are singing around us? You see the butterflies that come through on occasion? All of those things are part of the amus amazing world God has created for us. Think of hummingbirds. They're amazing little creatures, angry little buggers, but they're amazing and beautiful, right? And their colors and the way they operate. Think about a giraffe or a kangaroo or a whale, all the whales, all the, each different kind of whales starfish, the ocean itself, the stars at night. As we came out of the garden on Friday, the full moon as it was rising over the mountains was so beautiful. And we talked about the conversation we had is like some people see a man, other cultures see a rabbit in the moon. There was it just the beauty of, of that. Or the warmth of a sun on a nice spring day, right? Or strawberries, it's strawberry season. The sweetness of strawberries is amazing. Or sweet summer corn, right? Or, you know, we can go on and on and on. And the point being that God didn't have to give us the ability to taste anything or to taste a lot of things. He could have just given us, he didn't have to give that to us. Or, or the ability to see color. Or he didn't have to give us the ability to feel or to love, but, but he did. And when it says the Garden of Eden, all of the earth is a paradise. All of the earth is a garden. It's all good. And God said it was good. But in the middle of this garden, he created a place of pleasure, a place called Eden that was for us. 
And Eden was special not because of all the good stuff, but because God's presence was also always there. It was here that he could be found and that we could cultivate a relationship with us and him together. Eden was the temple in paradise. This is the reason I, I, I think it is most easy for people to take a walk on the beach or a walk in the mountains or just a walk through their garden and to find a sense of peace and rest and connection with neighbor, uh, nature. It's the reason why when you have just that one little pot on your desk, it just feels better than if your desk is bare. The garden was our first home, our first place of worship, and it reminds us of our created purpose in life, to be with our Father in a place of pleasure in the garden. All garden references in Scripture do the same thing. They draw us back to the Garden of Eden and to remind us of our created purpose. According to the Bible Project, uh, trees and gardens are the most mentioned living objects in Scripture outside of humans and God themselves trees and gardens that's got to be on purpose they appear at every key moment in human history from the rebellion in eden to adam and a abraham's sacrifice of isaac to every covenant god made there were trees or gardens involved to the prophecies of the messiah who was called the branch to jesus's death on the tree to the restoration of the tree of life that will come in the revelation when this all finishes in the end they're meant to remind us, all of those are meant to remind us of our relationship with God. Look, we're sitting under a tree and being blessed by its shade, right? And the goodness of it. Verse 9 in Genesis tells us, though, that um, introduces to us, though, the concept of why gardens are a part of God's plan. Out of the ground, Yahweh made to spring up every tree. Highlight that, every tree. Every tree God made was good. Every tree, don't, let, don't believe a lie that there was one that snuck in there wasn't good. Every tree was good and was pleasant for sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God created a planet, a planet full of trees. How many trees do you need to live and to be happy? Not very many. I mean, they're nice, right? You can use a lot. I mean, we use them for paper and all those kind of things, but that's kind of the one, the wasteful side of it. But for good things, to build a house, you know, to build a fire, to grow some fruit to grow on. I mean, you need trees, but you don't need a planet full. But God gave us a planet full of trees. In fact, most of the trees that are on this planet, most of us will never even see, except maybe on pictures on the Internet. But in the Temple of Eden, there were two specific kinds of trees, the Tree of Life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which I'm going to call the tree of love or choice. The tree of life is the center of God's presence. This tree was the source of healing and the source of our wholeness. It is where that they were to go to find eternal life as they needed, as long as they had access to this tree, they would never die. They would live forever. If the Garden of Eden then was the temple, then the tree of life is the holy of holies. It was the very center of there. There were no conditions to access to this tree. They had free access to the tree. God just gave them free access to it. But there was another tree. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Again, I call it the tree of the choice. And access to this tree was forbidden, actually. Not conditional at all. It was the tree that created the opportunity for humanity to decide if they loved God or not. God created us to love him, but love requires a choice. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Yahweh God took the human and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And Yahweh God commanded the human, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the day that you eat of it, you shall die. If you love me, keep my commandments. And our first parents chose to love their own desires and to walk away from him. Genesis 3, 6, and 7 says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to be, make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her. You need to underline that part. People forget that Adam was there. At this whole, he was participating in this whole process. And he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed the leaves together, and they made themselves loincloth. So they rebel against God. They chose their own desires over God's 
uh, desires. They walk away from the relationship they were created for. And death was not instantaneous. And that has given humanity a false sense of security ever since. But their choice to walk away had rif ripple effects in world history. Jealousy, greed, pride. And as those become bigger and bigger, they become war and genocide and famine and injustice, racism, all of those kinds of things. Humanity could not continue in that state. And they could not still have access to the tree of life. So in Genesis 3.22, we read, Then Yahweh God said, Behold, humanity has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest they reach out their hand and take also the tree of life and eat it and live forever. Therefore Yahweh God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. What would it be like to live forever but with cancer? With war wounds? With MS? with leprosy, with all of the different, what would that be like? So in the midst of this, God doesn't want us to continue to live with this, so he removes the tree, and death becomes a merciful pause. Verse 24, he drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. No, notice that imagery, cherubim with the flaming sword, and the garden that's there. When Yahweh instructs Moses to build the tabernacle, he's going to use this very same imagery in the model that's there. The Holy of Holies in the center of the temple is guarded by cherubim, both on the veil itself, which Jesus will break when he dies, and then also over the mercy seat. Leviticus 24 says that there's a golden menorah that's shaped like, guess what? a tree with buds on the end of it, and the flames come from the buds that are on the end of the tree. And that tree stands over the table of the presence of God, the, bread, the table of the bread of the presence of God. So these same garden symbols that are in the tabernacle then get transferred to the temple. And when the temple is built, the same thing is, is built there, the temples of both Solomon and Herod. And the temples were built on a high place in Jerusalem called Mount Moriah. Remember Mount Moriah? That's the place, the same place where Abraham offered his only son. And as he was about to do so, God stepped in with what? A tree and a the sacrifice. He provided a, a sacrifice in the tree that was there. The temple was not meant to be a, a new Garden of Eden, but it was meant to remind them and to step in that God was going to restore it. But how was that going to happen? When God condemned the serpent who enticed Adam and Eve in the garden, Yahweh promised in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Within Adam and Eve was a seed, the seed of the Messiah, the seed of the promise that he would come and restore everything. It would cost him his life. And the plan was put in motion, but it would take time. And in the meantime, Humanity, of course, did everything they could to try and get back into the Garden of Eden. But we did it by recreating our own gardens of worship. Can I pray for just a sec? Father, we have no idea what's going on and what the needs are, but there's someone who needed your help enough uh, that they called for, for the emergency services. So we pray that you would protect um, whoever it is, that uh, you would help the rescue crews to come on time and that you would speak in that moment to make them all recognize their need for you and the healing hand that you provide. Be honored in your son's name we pray. Amen. So in the meantime, humanity has been trying to get back to the Garden of Eden by our own efforts, by trying to recreate um, our own gardens of worship. And archaeology has shown Human buildings, humans have been building temples around the world on high places in every single corner. It's amazing to me how similar these places all are. They're always on a high place. And I think I'll just flip through these. The first one is at the Parthenon in, Greek, uh, in Greece, right? It's on a high place. The Tonkalat Temple in Burma. Beautiful place, right? On a high place. I don't think you can get much higher in that area. The Hanging Temple in China. And if it wasn't built on a high place, they would create man-made mountains as places of worship, like the ziggurats in Babylon, 
or the pyramids in Egypt, or the same kinds of pyramids also by the Mayans in Mexico and Central America, or even the mounds of the Vikings or the Celts in the British Isles. They would still build these, these mounds, these hills, these high places to try and get closer to God. And in the Old Testament, these gods originally were living trees. They would be places. There would be a tree that they would worship, Deuteronomy 16.21. Or it would be a grove of trees. Or it would be poles of trees that were stuck in a place. Uh, there would be wooden totem poles shaped like the gods that humanity had, inv had invented and imagined that their gods looked like. But they exist in every culture on every continent. In the Old Testament, they were called Asherah. You remember the story of Gideon who uh, he finally gets enough bravery and he goes and he chops down the Asherah that was in his father's garden. And there was so much wood left over, there was enough wood for a fire to, build, to sacrifice a bull on. That's a lot of wood. It wasn't just a, a pole in the corner. He chopped down probably a living tree that was there. But God's plan was still in action and the seed passed through Noah and Abraham. And God promised Abraham that through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed, Genesis 9.9. 9. And it passed to King David. And King David was promised that one of his seed would be sit on the throne forever. And then through the sons of David, and God promised through the prophets that a branch of this tr uh, the tree of David would become a righteous branch that would be raised up. Jeremiah, Isaiah, it's all over the prophets. They talk about the righteous branch. And thousands of years after the seed was promised, Acts chapter 13, verse 23 says, Of David's seed, God promised, uh, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. But Jesus' mission was not just to be the seed, not just to be present, but that the seed would die also on a tree in order to remove the curse that was in the garden. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, God redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for, uh, for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Because, and because of his death on a tree, on a tree, remember that's where we started, was with trees. Because of his death on a tree, our relationship with the Father can be restored again. 1 Peter chapter 2, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you, should, you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but you have been returned to our shepherd and the overseer of our souls. So Jesus then becomes the tree of life for us, and he is our source. He said in John 15, verse 5, I am, most of the time we read the word tree, but in Hebrew it's the same word. Eights is the same word for vine and tree. I am the tree, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is who bears much fruit. For apart from you, you can do nothing. Abiding, bearing fruits, loving are all a part of the life of being a part of the vine, the tree that is Jesus. He continues in verse 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy might be full. That's where joy is. Joy is in the tree of life. So now what? Paradise exists today, but only as a shadow, only as a remnant of what it was. And all the goodness in this world, in this paradise, as good as it is to sit under this tree in this garden, it's temporary, right? One of the saddest things at Disneyland is they had to take out those trees in front of the Pirates of the Caribbean because they just got old and rotted, and they had to take them out and be replaced. Even in a place like that, with all that money, they couldn't save those beautiful trees. It's, all of this is temporary. All that good spring fruits, you have to wait. The seasons pass. You have to wait through uh, for the next season. The problem is that we live in this broken world and we spend our lives trying to create our own gardens of pleasure. And then we fill it with our own gods. But the real, eternal paradise awaits anyone who abides in Jesus. Luke 23 says, And we 
and deed justly, for we are receiving the reward of our deeds. But this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. That was a thief on the cross. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly today you will be with me in paradise, in the garden. We're going back to the garden. In that eternal garden, God will give us access again to the tree of life so that we can live eternally with the Father. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7 says, To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the garden of God. God is good so that we don't have to look elsewhere. All of this is going to fade as good as it is. It's temporary. It's going to fade. But he has invited us into his presence, into the garden, the paradise of God. And Jesus is preparing a place for us there. That's what he said. Jesus, uh, John 14, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I not have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, and that where I am, where I am you may be also. And verse 6 says, Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Access to that garden is only through Jesus. But it is not only getting to paradise. It's not only just about getting to that place, that paradise. We still get a little bit of a taste of it here, right? And the goodness of what we have together. But it, it's also about the abundant life that we get to live until then. Jesus is the tree of life. He said, I'm the vine, abide in me. Abundant life comes from living, resting, rela having a relationship with him. So the question this morning on this Resurrection Sunday is, are you resting in Jesus? Are you abiding in him? Are you dependent on him for your sustenance? Are you living in obedience to him? For your well, are you dependent on him for your well-being? Or do you just turn to him when things get bad? It's hard, I know. It, it, it takes, it's a lot to take in. But Jesus said that faith is like a mustard seed, right? Just a little seed is all it'll take. Lean on that. The kingdom of heaven is like a seed as well. Just take what you have and trust God with that little seed. Each of us, though, as well, can be a tree of life or a tree of choice in the lives of others. We can drag people down and, and tempt them. We, we can be a, a source of temptation for them. Or we can go and spread the seed. Remember, God said his word is like a seed, and we can take that word and spread it to others. Today, I wanted to give you something to remind you of the garden that we're in today and the garden that we are called to. And there's little, a basket full of little seeds there. There are wildflower seeds, butterfly seeds, sunflower seeds that you can take. And you can take the little basket and you can use the little envelope and you can set it on your desk, you can tape it to your mirror, whatever it is that helps to remind you that we are headed for a garden, a paradise with God. We get to be with him for eternity. And we get to live and trust in him, abide in him in the meantime. Or you can take the seeds and you can plant them. They're live seeds. They're good seeds. I got them from a good seed company. So you can plant them in your garden if you want them. And you can do that. Um, and as they grow, you can remember that the kingdom of God is growing and spreading all around you if we would just have eyes to see and ears to hear. Gardens and trees are keys to the gospel, and all gardens can remind us of our original home and our eternal destiny. Father, thank you that you love us so much to create such abundance for us, such beauty, such joyful places for us to be. Help us to live. Help us to see the goodness around us and to live as faithful stewards of it, but also uh, help it to be an, uh, uh, um, a reminder to us that we can live in joy and hope and peace because you are a good God who loves us and sent his son to die for us. And now your spirit can live within us so that we can abide in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.